Good morning and welcome to Crescent Church this morning. Whether you're a visitor uh, joining with us for the first time or whether you've been with us through um, this the 17th of our online services then I'd like to make you especially welcome. This morning we're continuing our series in Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount and we're looking forward to what David Russell has to share with us later on looking at the topic of treasure and anxiety. We're going to start our service off straight away by singing um, a song that we love called There Is A Hope. The words tell us of not a hope that is earthly, not a hope that is fleeting, but a certain hope that we have in um, what Christ has done for us and in um, finally making it to our, our future home in heaven. So let's sing together the words of There Is A Hope. incredible hope we have in Christ. Let's bring our time this morning together to God in prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope that we have in you, a sure and steadfast hope, a hope that gives us strength for every passing day. Lord, we thank you that you are the one that whispers courage to us. You are the one that fills us with unspeakable joy. And you are the one that will lead us home. Lord, we pray that we would rely solely on you for our hope, that earthly desires would not rule our lives, but that the desire to serve our risen Saviour would. Lord, we give you thanks that we can still meet as a church family virtually each week, despite the isolation that this pandemic has caused. We ask that you would be the comfort to those who are lonely, the strength to those who are feeling weak, and the light to the path for those who are lost. 
We pray particularly for those in charge of steering us out of the various lockdown measures and ask that you would guide them as they seek to do so safely. We ask for wisdom for our church elders as they too look ahead to a time when we can all meet together in the church building again safely. Our prayer is that you would lead them in the decisions they make about that return. We want to bring the members of our congregation before you who are struggling at this time, whether it's due to the loss of a loved one or they're facing illness, those who are waiting for or recovering from surgery, those who are struggling with job loss or struggling with balancing parenting and a full-time job in these challenging circumstances. We ask that you would undertake for them. We pray that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords would be their comfort, their strength and their portion in whatever they are going through. We pray too for those around us as we are called to be light in darkness. We ask that through us you would shine into the lives of those we come into contact with, that you would be glorified through our actions as we seek to live lives that honour you. As we continue our series on the Sermon on the Mount this morning, we ask that you would help us to learn and understand what it is to be a Christian in the culture that we live in. We ask that you would empower us to act in a way that is countercultural. Lord, please speak through your servant David and give us open ears and open hearts to what he has to say to us. All these things we ask in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's now that part of the service that is mainly for the kids, but I know so many of us enjoy. Sharon Johnson is going to read us the kids' story entitled A Little Girl and the Proud General. And then Amy Cullen is going to lead us in the actions to the song, Hey, Jesus Loves Me. A Little Servant Girl and the Proud General from 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman was a very important man in a very important army of a very important country. You see, he was very, very, very important. But Naaman was sick. He had leprosy, which is a, a nasty thing that stops you from feeling anything. Bits of you fall off without you noticing, like bashed fingers and squished toes. It might sound funny, but it wasn't. And Naaman certainly wasn't laughing. There was no cure. It never went away. And in the end, it killed you. Naaman needed help. Now there was a little slave girl who worked for Naaman and she knew someone who could help him. But there was a problem. Naaman was her enemy. Not long before, Naaman had led an army raid on her home in Israel. He had killed her whole family, carried her off to Syria and made her into his slave. Every night she cried herself to sleep. She had lost everything. So why would she, of all people, want to help Naaman? Didn't she hate him and want to, want to hurt him back? Didn't she want to make him pay for the wrong he had done? That's what you would expect. But instead of hating him, she loved him. Instead of hurting him back, she forgave him. I want Naaman to get well, she said to her mistress. And there's a man in Israel called Elisha who can help him. Oh, well, I'll go, said Naaman, loading up his wagons and putting on his flashing armour. But I will go to the palace because that's where someone important like me gets healed. So he hurried off to Israel and went straight to the king. My healing, please, he announced. Well, I can do lots of things, the king replied, but only God can heal. And just then a message from Elisha arrived. Send Naaman here, it read. So Naaman hurried off to Elisha's house. But Elisha didn't even come out and greet him. He just sent a servant instead. Hmm. Doesn't Elisha realise who I am? Naaman thought. 
But what the servant said next made him even crosser. Wash in there, he said. <laughs> Just wash? <laughs> Naaman laughed. In that slimy, stinky river? <laughs> he looked around to see if this was some kind of joke, but it wasn't. Any person could wash in a river, he thought. I and I'm Naaman. I am important. I should do something important for God to heal me. And he rode off in a rage. Of course, you and I both know that's not how God does things. All Naaman needed was nothing. And that was the one thing Naaman didn't have. You see, God knew that Naaman was even sicker on the inside than he was on the outside. Naaman was proud. He thought he didn't need God. His heart didn't work properly. It couldn't feel anything. You see, Naaman had leprosy of his heart. God was not only going to heal Naaman's skin, he was going to heal his pride. Naaman finally agreed to wash in the river and instantly his skin became smooth like a baby. Naaman wanted to pay Elisha. God healed you. You can't pay, Elisha said. It's free. And so it was that a very sick man was healed. All because, all because of a little servant girl who forgave him. God knew sin was like leprosy. It stopped his children's hearts from working properly and in the end, it would kill them. Years later, God was going to send another servant to forgive, just as she did. To forgive all of God's children and heal the terrible sickness in their hearts. But their hearts were broken, but... God can mend broken hearts. Love for you and me. I wish we could understand the price that you.
Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Amy, for leading us in both the kids' song and story this morning. What wonderful truths are found in both of those. We're now going to sing together the words of Be Still My Soul, words that remind us of how we should put our trust in God through all the, the difficulties of life, all the things that make us anxious. We can fully rely on him. So let's sing Be Still My Soul. <laughs>
thank you once again to our musicians who have worked so hard in the background to bring us the hymns and songs as they have done for so many weeks that allow us to praise God. We're going to have our reading this morning uh, and Scott Robinson is going to read Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 to 34 and after that David Russell is going to speak to us on treasure and anxiety. Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 to 34 Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also the eye is the lamp of the body so if your eye is healthy your whole body will be full of light but if your eye is bad your whole body will be full of darkness if then the light in you is darkness how great is the darkness no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other you cannot serve God and money therefore I tell you do not be anxious about your life what you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing look at the birds of the air they neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not of more value than they and which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life and why are you anxious about clothing Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow was thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all but seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious for itself sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Good morning everyone, we're really glad that you could join with us. Over these weeks we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount, which was given by the Lord Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, where he paints an extraordinary picture of life as a citizen of the Kingdom of God. He outlines how his followers fulfill the eternal purposes of God as his holy people and also how our attitude and behaviour should match up to our new identity in him. We've looked already at Christ's teaching on what true blessing is, on the attitudes of our hearts and the actions that mark a true follower of Jesus. And this morning we're picking up with the next section which Scott read to us where the Lord describes to us how the righteousness of his kingdom works out in the details of people's everyday lives. This section divides up into two parts and in both parts the Lord's people are called to make a choice. And can I encourage you to have your Bibles open at this passage as we go through it together. Firstly in verses 19 to 24 the Lord calls his followers to choose where their treasure lies, in God or in wealth. And secondly, in verses 25 to 34, he calls them to choose their outlook on life, either faith or anxiety. So firstly, in verses 19 to 24, the Lord warns his followers not to be so focused on laying up treasures on earth. But what does he mean by that? Well, money is certainly a part of what he is talking about. Christ goes on to mention money explicitly in verse 24. But the idea of treasure has a much broader scope. 
It includes all kinds of things that bring us rewards in the here and now. The Lord's touched on this idea already earlier on in this chapter, which Ollie unpacked for us last week. Christ talked several times about people who give to the poor and pray and fast just so that they can be seen and praised by other people. Just so that people can say, look at how great they are. Religious leaders like the Pharisees were especially good at that. They weren't really doing these things for God at all. They were doing them mostly for public and professional acclaim. They valued the praise of others more than God. That's what they worked for. That's what they treasured. And here the Lord makes it clear that each one of his followers has to choose where their treasure really lies. They must choose what they find most valuable. The things of the world or the things of God. Are we going to focus more on what brings us reward in the short term? Or things that are going to store up greater future reward in eternity? To help us put that into perspective, Christ spells out the outcome of each of these choices. He says that if we prioritise treasuring up treasures on earth, whether it's making lots of money or gathering up material possessions, whether it's houses or cars or holidays or whatever it might be, or whether it's obsessing over our education or obsessing over how we look or prioritising our career at the cost of everything else. Christ warns us that none of those things will ultimately last. Now, there's nothing wrong with aiming high and achieving our goals. There's nothing wrong with having money and success. God has given us lots of good things to enjoy. But if those things are our primary focus and our primary motivation, then that's very foolish because those things only last for a very short time. Every time the Lord talked about the Pharisees valuing the praise of others, he said they have received their reward. In other words, that was all the reward they would ever get. Just that fleeting human adulation that was there one minute and gone the next. They gained nothing permanent from that. Those kinds of treasures are of no account eternally. They fade away and they disappear. Either they'll corrode and decay or thieves will break in and steal those treasures away. Whenever the singer Leonard Cohen was in his early 70s, he had been a writer and a musician for over 40 years and he'd worked really hard throughout his career to gather up a large body of work. And between album sales and touring, he had managed to amass a small fortune. And now when he was older and semi-retired, one day he discovered to his horror that his longtime manager had purloined millions of dollars of his money. So much that he was now left with very, very little. And he had no way to get any of that money back. And to add insult to injury, she had even sold the rights to some of his most famous songs. So he no longer owned some of the material that he had spent so long creating. Things were so bad that at age 74, he had to go back on the road. He had to go back on tour. All those years spent gathering up so much. And in the end, it all got snatched away. That's the destiny of earthly treasure. But Christ says that if we lay up treasures in heaven, then the outcome will be very different. Those treasures will never fade. Those treasures will never be taken away. But what does he mean by treasure in heaven? Well, whenever Paul wrote to Timothy, he alluded to this very idea. He warned people not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of earthly riches, but to set their hopes on the certainty of God. Christ is encouraging us to invest in him, which is the only kind of investment that's not subject to loss, that isn't at the mercy of an unstable economy, 
or damage or decay. If we devote and dedicate our lives first and foremost to the Lord, if we make Him our priority, if we make ourselves available to Him for His work and His purposes, then that investment will have untold eternal value. But what does that look like in day-to-day life? Well, the starting point, of course, is to invest in time with the Lord. Studying and meditating on his word. We have to put in the time getting to know him better. Developing that relationship. Talking to him and letting him talk to us. I think we're all grateful that lockdown has been lifting over the past week or two. And that we aren't as restricted as we were. But I don't know about you. But I had great plans at the beginning of lockdown. To use the time to get lots of work done in the house and finish lots of drawings that I was working on and maybe even do 5k every day. And I have to be honest with you, it just didn't happen. And maybe you're the same. But can I encourage you that if you spent time during isolation with the Lord, reading your Bible, getting to understand it in a deeper way, praying to him, becoming more like him, just like many people in our church were doing, then that was time that was well invested. You have stored up treasure that will stand you in good stead forever. Paul went on in 1 Timothy to encourage God's people to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Thus, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. Treasure in heaven is gathered through simple acts of godly goodness and love. Being kind to one another. Being compassionate. Helping out where it's needed for the glory of God. Even giving our money as God has blessed us to help other people. Or to help with the work of the Lord. Like anyone who has ever made a financial investment will know, investments can be costly. It can mean personal sacrifice. I know someone who was a prominent academic and he was offered some really exciting opportunities to teach and lecture overseas for an extended period of time, which would have raised his profile across the globe. But he chose not to take those opportunities because He was also a Bible teacher and he had devoted himself to the work of his local church. That work for God was more valuable to him than the prominence and the wealth that he could have had. Because he trusted that the results of that work would reverberate down through all eternity. Now we won't always see the results in our lifetime. Unfortunately, our investment might seem to have very little return in the short term. And that can be very frustrating for us. If you've ever worked in overseas mission or in preaching or in young people's work in rally or Sunday school or on summer teams and you haven't seen as much impact as you hoped you would, you can sometimes be tempted to wonder if it's all been for naught, if you've just been wasting your time and Wasting your effort. Well, we can be assured that in eternity, the Lord will show us how he has blessed what we have given to him. What we have invested in him. How he's increased it. How he's matured it in ways that are impossible for us to imagine. Nothing that we invest in the Lord will return empty. And the Lord himself has promised to reward us at his judgment seat one day if we're faithful to him now. If our hearts are fixed firmly on him. And Christ says our heart is what is at stake here. Where your treasure is, the Lord says, there will your heart be also. Whenever the Bible talks about the heart, it's really describing the very centre of a person's being. Their emotions, their reason their will. What we value dictates where our very self is created, is located. The Lord uses another image to illustrate that. 
He says that the eye is the lamp of the body. If a person's eye is healthy, then the light pours in and we can see clearly. But if our eye is bad, if we have impaired vision, then the light doesn't get through and there's only darkness. Jewish literature talks about the eye in much the same way as it talks about the heart. And what the Lord is saying is that if we have a single desire for God, if we accept his word, if we are motivated by him, then our whole lives are flooded with his light. We see life as it truly is. We have clarity and perspective. But if we're trying to live for two worlds, if we're trying to live for God, but at the same time we can't quite let go of our earthly treasures, then it's like we're trying to do two opposing things at once. James called that type of Christian a double-minded man. Someone who is facing in two opposite directions at the same time. And James says that makes him unstable in all his ways. Stumbling around in spiritual blindness. Rejecting the light of God's word leaves us in intense darkness. It's almost like the light gets cancelled out. Now the Lord doesn't mean that we lose our salvation. But we lose the vision of how rich we are in God. And we are rendered completely spiritually ineffective. We stagger between the world and the Lord. The Lord says it's, try, it's like trying to serve two masters. You can't serve effectively if your attention is divided. One master will ultimately take precedence over the other. It's like working two jobs. You can never really give your all to just one of those employers, can you? Now the word serve is actually much stronger in the original text. It's not really the image of an employee. It's actually the image of a slave. And when we approach this kind of image in the Bible, we have to be very careful. Because the Lord Jesus is not condoning slavery. Not in any way. God hates slavery. You only need to read the book of Exodus to discover that. He's not implying that whenever we follow Christ, God enslaves us in any way. Christ came to free us from slavery forever. What the Lord is doing here is he's using an image from everyday life that his listeners at the time would have been very familiar with to explain how important it is for us to maintain our focus on him. In early New Testament times, house slaves were common and that slave would be the sole property of that one master. They couldn't divide themselves between two people. They had to give their master exclusive service. And Christ is explaining that if we divide our loyalties, if we are like those Pharisees who gave to the poor out of divided motivations, then we're of no use whatsoever in the service of God because we're not fully invested. So we have to make up our minds either to put God first or to live for material things and reject Christ's claim on us. And the tragedy is that if we choose that second option, then the reward that he wants to give us for faithful service, a reward that's more amazing and more incredible than any reward it's possible to gain on earth, it'll be lost to us. All of our works will be burned up and come to nothing. If we aim for a crown that perishes rather than one that's everlasting. What it all comes down to is this. How much do you value Jesus? As you think about that, think for a moment about how much he values you. Think for a moment how his focus and motivation and loyalty never wavered for one second. Even when he hung on the cross because you meant so much to him. He gave himself unreservedly for you. He thought that you were worth sacrificing everything for. What is he worth to you? 
Is he worth anything to you at all? If you're listening in this morning and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, see for a moment how valued you are by God. So much that the creator of life himself was crucified to rescue you from the slavery of sin. To make you one of his very own. So that you could be with him forever. Like a father and his child. Now you could spend a lifetime storing up for the future in all kinds of ways. But unless you have Jesus, you have nothing for eternity. If you give your heart to him, he'll give you an inheritance that will never pass away. Nothing and no one can ever touch it or spoil it. The God of eternity wants to come into your very heart because he wants to dwell with you every day. So think how it must grieve him when the hearts of his people are away off somewhere else. Where is your heart this morning? One good way of finding that out is to honestly answer this question. What do I spend most of my time thinking about? And if the answer is something on earth, then raise your eyes to heaven and ask the Lord to draw your heart to the one in whom God himself finds all his treasure. And seek the things that are above, where Christ is, as Paul said in Colossians. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. And then secondly, in verses 25 to 34, Christ couples his teaching on what we value with teaching on anxiety, which is no coincidence. And Christ presents his people with another choice. They need to choose what their outlook on life will be. Will it be faith or will it be anxiety? Whenever we expend so much effort and energy on earthly treasures, it creates an immense amount of anxiety, doesn't it? We're anxious to get the things we need. We're anxious to get more of what we want. And we're anxious not to lose what we've got. But... If our hearts are set on Christ, the Lord says there is no need for us to be anxious about anything. Now it's really crucial here to point out that some forms of anxiety come from deeper psychological or mental health conditions. And it's really important that if we're feeling intense anxiety and stress that we talk to a doctor about that. The Lord is talking about day-to-day anxieties and worries that all of us experience linked to the everyday things of life. And he boils it down here to two very simple and very essential things. Food and clothing. And the Lord says definitively, do not be anxious about any of these things. Don't worry about where they're going to come from. Because you have a Father in heaven who loves you and provides for you. Now Christ isn't saying that we don't have to work to provide for what we need on a daily basis. He's not giving us a ticket to easy living. He's saying that we shouldn't be looking down the road fearfully, worrying if we're going to have the basic things that we need. Whenever we're anxious about these things, we're not really trusting in the Lord's goodness, are we? We're choosing to rely on ourselves and our own means and our own methods rather than on the limitless resources of God. We're limiting the one who has no limits, denying his awesome power and wisdom. Now that can be easy to say, but worry is more natural for some of us than others. And I can sympathise with that because worry is my default position. I'm a real worrier. And I might be talking this morning to an older person who has recently lost a husband or wife and you're honestly not sure how you're going to get by long term. Or there might be a younger person listening with a young family who has just lost their job. Or like so many others, you're facing the prospect of unemployment over these next few months. And 
You're wondering how you're going to keep paying your mortgage or your rent and still afford this year's school uniforms. There's a lot for you to worry about. But to you, Christ says, do not be anxious. Whenever we choose to worry, we can start devoting so much of our time and so much of our resources to making sure that we have enough. And thinking about that so much, almost independent of God, that we start to miss out on what life is really all about. That preoccupation can come at the expense of knowing and serving the Lord and living for him. So Christ says, instead of worrying, have faith in your Lord instead. Don't miss the whole point of life. It's not about these material things. It's about something more. Cast all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. We have every reason to have faith in God. Jesus says, just look at the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. If God cares so much for even the birds and the lilies, then how much more will he care for those Christ died for? The two worries that the Lord identifies here, food and clothing, originated with the fall. It was only after we sinned that mankind had to worry about where they were going to get food from or about finding clothing. Sin is embedded at the very root of material anxieties. And the Lord doesn't want that kind of life for any of us. We were never meant for that. So look at the incredible agreement that he makes with his people in verse 33. In effect, he says, if you put God's interests first in your life, I will guarantee your future needs. If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then I will make sure that you never lack the necessities of life. Now there are times when it seems like we don't have everything we need. In 2 Corinthians, Paul talked about times when he suffered hunger and thirst and nakedness. Putting God's work first didn't always make for an easy time. But God ultimately provided for his needs again and again. And you'll notice that it's our needs that are guaranteed, not our greed. We don't get everything we want. He doesn't promise us an important job or the perfect girl or the perfect guy or the ideal life that we might dream about. He promises us what's necessary. And maybe we need to adjust our priorities and learn to value most what God himself values, which is a tough process for all of us. But whenever our hearts disentangle from the world, and re-engage with God's Son, then anxiety begins to loosen its grip. Philippians 4 famously encourages us to be anxious about nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. A steadfast focus and faith in God is the way to meet the, tr- is the, way to meet the troubles of tomorrow. George Muller took this promise very literally. He took Christ at his word and he proved him faithful again and again. And George Muller said this. He said, where anxiety begins, faith ends. But where faith begins, anxiety ends. Choose to have faith. Choose to trust completely in the one who loves us. Casting all of our anxieties on him. And we can know the peace of God in our hearts that passes all understanding. I saw a post on Facebook the other day. You might have seen it. It was a homeless man kneeling in the street with his hands lifted up into the air. And at first glance, it looked like someone crying out in despair. Until you read the caption beneath it. The man was praising God that even though he had next to nothing on earth, 
he had abundant riches stored up for him in heaven. He was richer than anyone could imagine simply because he had Jesus. Now, whether that photo was genuine or not, it certainly made me think. Where is my treasure? What do I value most? What am I treasuring up? The things of earth or the things of God? Now, we all have to make that choice. How could we fail to choose the one who gave us every single treasure of his person with nothing held back? The one who offers to free us from all the anxieties of being tangled up in the treasures of earth and give us true and lasting peace if we'll only place our focus and our faith in him. May the Lord help each of us to fix our hearts firmly on Christ to find our treasure in him daily, as the Father himself does, and to work to store up more and more of what counts for eternity. Let's close our time together in prayer. Our Father, we want to thank you that in a world so full of uncertainties and anxieties, in a world so prone to decay and destruction and loss, We have a treasure that is eternal in the person of your Son. Father, we thank you that he gave himself freely for us, nothing held back. And we ask that as we meditate on him and the love that he has for us, that we would want to treasure up more of him in our lives, that we'd prioritise him in all things, that we'd make a full investment in the things of Christ. We thank you, Father, that even when it's tough and even when it's costly, That's the wisest investment that any of us can make. And we pray that as we face the needs and challenges of each day, that we'll face them with focus and faith in him, without anxiety or fear, choosing instead to trust in the one who loves us, knowing that those who trust him wholly find him wholly true. And it's in his name that we now pray, giving you thanks. Amen. Our closing hymn is The Lord is Our Salvation. Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save, faithful in love? My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation.